Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. This is actually, uh, I'm not very used to give speeches. I'm not very good at like giving talks about my work and the people I work with. So bear with me, don't shoot the pianist. And uh, I'm gonna try to spend the next 50 minutes or an hour uh, giving you some examples of uh, work that I can share because of course I work for clients that are under confidentiality, so I can't share all the work that I do for all the clients I've been working in the past and in the present. But uh, when I was invited, and um, I thought, okay, let's try to give a perspective on uh, uh, my last few years, especially in branding. And uh, I'll be very happy at the end, or even during the presentation, if you have questions, even like, uh, pragmatic question about the way we work in studios, etc. I'm very happy to, if I can be of any help in answering, uh, I'm here for that. So I will show, I'm not sure how many projects I've put together, probably uh, seven, eight, nine projects, I don't remember. Uh, I've taken a couple projects from the past and um, the, the rest of the work is very recent, the past three years, more or less. Um, and uh, it's a mix of art direction and branding. The things are merging more, more and more nowadays. When I started working in branding, that is not at the beginning of my career, but later on, branding was mainly like corporate identity or packaging design. Or, and nowadays, is much more visual, is much more verbal, is much more three-dimensional, is much more engaging and experiential. So my, my job is changing and I'm very happy about that because I can use skills that I had in the past that I can reuse. So to give you an idea of what's been my path in my uh, professional life uh, so far, I'm originally from Tuscany. I did my first studies in Tuscany. I started collaborating with artists and uh, design studios in, uh, in around Florence, around Siena when I was very young. And then I was invited to, uh, for my first job in Milan uh, in a studio that was called Dark, when Domus Academy had a research studio separated from the school. So I didn't do those Domus Academy. I just went straight into working for them. Um, and it was very international. We were only 15 people. The creative directors were very strong, Mario Trimarchi, uh, Marco Susani, and uh, a very good vibe of an international studio in Milan. We had great clients and great research projects. From there, I moved to Japan. I was invited with a very good friend that we share with Silvia to do a small setup of a studio uh, in Japan. And I stayed there for uh, five months, four or five months. And, uh, and then I got accepted uh, to go to, to the Royal College of Art in London. There was a dream since I was very young. And uh, I spent two years at the Royal College and um, I managed to uh, work while I, while I was studying there as well. I really enjoyed it. It was very, very challenging. I came from a um, not UK-centric approach to design. I started in Italy, I started in Milan, and I arrived in a completely different platform. Royal College at the time was all about being not commercial, challenging everything, doing everything as far away as possible and finding your, your soul, finding your approach to design. And at the beginning for me was like a shock, a total shock. The first few months I was like, um, it was very different from what I expected. And then I started finding my, my way of doing things that of course they were so not commercial that when I left, left the Royal College, I had lots of press, lots of reviews in cool magazines but I was doing job interviews because I needed a job and people were looking at me like an alien, like a total, total freak. So l lots of invitations to give speeches, to present work in magazines, but commercially, mm, not very good. So I went back to freelancing, I went back more to art direction, less arty work. 
and slowly I found my way in London. I work with great people. And then all of a sudden I go for a job in a, um, in a branding agency and uh, I started my career in branding. That is what I'm gonna show you today uh, because it's my recent work and uh, it's probably what I'm, uh, it's what I'm gonna focus now. Uh, I did uh, four or five years as creative director at the Brand Union. I'm going to show you a couple of jobs I did there. I did lots of work, but uh, I, don't I don't like looking back uh, too much. I like looking at what I do now. And uh, now I'm executive creative director of Future Brand here in Milan. Uh, there is a great studio. And on the side, overnight and weekends, I run a really small magazine, a niche magazine that works with artists, photographers, and writers, and I'm gonna show you something at the end. All the work that I'm about to show you is a work as a creative director, so it's work that I've done with people. I'm not, I do something by myself, I still design, uh, I enjoy designing, but nothing is possible of what you'll be seeing in the next few slides without a great team, so I'm, when possible, I will mention the names of the people that I worked with, but I'm very grateful to every designer that still work with me and I've worked with in the past. Let's start from something, um, because you have vehicle design, I, I chose the first, the first piece of work, I chose something a bit challenging. Um, we, when I was working in London, I was approached by Alfa Romeo, and um, they had an amazing, uh, guy who was running the department of image and everything at Alfa Romeo. And Alfa Romeo was doing really badly. They had really, um, I don't know how much I could say because I'm filmed, but they had really ugly cars at the time. And all of a sudden they came up, uh, they invited me to, um, to see a prototype of this car. And they said, oh, we are gonna call it Mito. And we want a logo that is different from the logo of any other car. Uh, at the time, never done a logo for any car. That's something completely new for me. Now I've worked for Y, I worked for them. I've done identities for cars, but it was very new. And um, it was a pitch against other agencies. Unfortunately, I have to do lots of pitches. That is very uh, uh, demanding, I mean, uh, physically and psychologically. So I went to see the car, I came back to London. We sat down with all the designers, we did lots of sketches. And we said, okay, let's, let's not go back just with logos, but let's try to find a territory because yes, you can do a logo that is just right and aesthetically pleasing and working, but nowadays more and more is important to find a story or a territory for, for a product, for a brand, and the logo should derive from that. It shouldn't be just, I like that type, or I've done this drawing, that's it. You should, you should have a good um, creative idea behind it. So I, actually last night, I, I found an old hard drive, and I'm gonna show you an extract of what I presented the first presentation. These are just, because it's not under confidentiality anymore, and I don't care. But the, I've chosen six pages of the books that I presented. Of course, the books were much deeper, there were videos and all that. But to give you an idea of how, how I approach a project, okay? So, because it was a cool car, and it was the relaunch of Alfa Romeo, I created four territories. I'm not gonna show you the third one, because the third one was given by the, the client, and it was music and I didn't agree on that territory, so of course I presented an identity and, I, and, and a concept around that, but I didn't believe in it from the beginning, so it's not here. Um, so the first one was to um, have an icon of a car. So try to draw a logo that was really encapsulating what Alpha had been really good at, making amazing cars. And the first logo that, uh, so Alpha had always a reference to sensuous curves and uh, quite aerodynamic, a bit stylish. But the car was really small. This was the first small car from, from Alfa Romeo. So I'd, we draw a logo that uh, was 
drawn around the profile of the car itself. So I'll show you the profile already. Uh, again, sorry, this is the profile of the car. And the first concept that we presented had the same typography. So an uh, abstraction of how the car looks like. But of course, very a bit young, not pretentious, and um, who, that could have legs to be applied as, a, as an icon on merchandising and all the other aspects that we created. Uh, the second concept uh, that was used later on within Alfa Romeo for, um, for relaunching another car that I'll show you later. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm still, I was at the time, I'm still a big fan of uh, graphic design from the 30s. And Alfa Romeo has an amazing heritage uh, from the 30s. So I went back doing uh, research on typography and um, identities around that area, so graphic shapes. And how can we write this letter so that it becomes a logo and not just a lettering on the back of the car? And I call this concept Futur Alpha. So trying to bring the 30s in the 21st century. So looking back at all the typography like Mostra, all the uh, great uh, magazines that uh, were created in the 30s, especially in the Milan area that was a great uh, area for um, design and uh, graphic design. And the MAD logo that was presented about around this was more of an icon than, uh, than a logo itself. So the, 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 the four letters create uh, a mini logo. And the, the area that actually was chosen um, more derived from uh, the name itself, so the name Myth, and the target that this car was addressing, there was people your generation, your age, young, young guys, people that want to have a cool car, like a mini, okay, this was the um, alternative to the mini at the time, as still is was creating this um, visual identity around the concept of an urb urban legend. So we went back looking at graffiti artists at the beginning, but it was very difficult to create an identity and it was very overused. So s something that was more uh, abstract. So we started eating away parts of the letters, creating a code, like in the 80s ID Magazine did in, uh, in their masthead with the amazing uh, um, example of their logo. And then all of a sudden, this is what we created. So this started an alphabet. We created an alphabet of letters. And this is the first logo that really challenged as well the way that you apply a logo to a car. I had so many issues with the engineers that they have to organize at the end of the production line how a logo is applied to a car. Because usually you do your stamp, you've got an object that glues the logo on the back of the car, always in the same position, has to take a certain amount of time of the uh, person who's in charge of that. And you don't want to mess around with having little dots or uh, funny angle typography. But we insisted, we didn't take a no at the beginning because of course the beginning was, we can't do it. Okay, this is impossible, we cannot do it. I said, okay, let's sit down, let's have a look at how you do it, how do you apply it, how do you create a mask in order to have it positioned properly, how can we optimize it, how can we make it um, re done over and over again. And this is uh, what came out and it's still, um, it was used then as a concept then that ran through the story of, uh, of the launch. The launch had little icons done by, ad by, by the advertising uh, agency in order to communicate this concept of the urban legend. And the car is still out there and this is the final result um, with all the prototyping. We did prototyping in, uh, first in laser cut on uh, paperboard and then we started analyzing how the, the curve will be on, a, on each single letter in order to be um, um, made and at the same time applied to the car. And slowly we got to the final solution. 
not that slowly actually, because when you work for client in, clients, nothing is low. Um, I kept working for Alpha when I arrived in Milan, and starting from the visual identity of Mito, we were invited to uh, create the identity and the concept for the uh, centenary. They were celebrating 100 years. And the idea here was that um, for a myth, so Alfa Romeo is, is a myth, time doesn't exist. So we created 12 posters where we always try to look at something from the past but reused with a contemporary approach. So the first one that I did with a, a good illustrator called Cy Scott, that is based in between London and, uh, and New York, was to reinterpret the concept of, of the heart. Alfa Romeo has always done campaigns with hearts because we are Italian, passion, etc. And with Cy, we said, okay, let's, let's have something that is um, bit more interesting. Let's draw a heart all made of streets. And, and this guy draws everything by hand. He's an incredible illustrator. Highly recommend you to look at his work. Don't remember which agent is, uh, agency is under, probably Dutch Uncle. And this was the first poster. The second one, I don't know if it's very visible, but we went back to study, uh, I think it was Henry Ford, that uh, there is a story from the 30s that every time he, uh, an Alfa Romeo was passing by, he was, in, as a sign of respect, he was um, um, taking off his, his hat. So we chose the last car, and then we had uh, an illustration of the hat and a little copy at the bottom that was telling this little story. And then we did other posters. We went back to look at um, stories of why Alfa Romeo had uh, three uh, front lights when they were um, competing in the 30s, overlaying their uh, most advanced technology um, um, engine with uh, a car from the 40s. And after that, I started developing with the, with the team um, more of an art direction for the launch of the new car, there was the Giulietta. And we pushed them to work in black and white, we pushed them to work on multiply with very dynamic shape, and then they went on shooting Uma Truman with the advertising agency in black and white, using this multiply red, and creating the look and feel for uh, the new car that was called uh, Giulietta. It was supposed to be called Milano, but then it was a change. This is the other, uh, the only other old project that I've chosen. Uh, when I was creative director in London, I was responsible for the global rebranding of Vodafone. Now, when you work for such a big, uh, this was probably 10 years ago, and telecoms had the same drive as now have um, the Google, the Facebook of, of this era. At the time, all the interest was in telecoms because they were the new, the new te technology. And they were growing and growing. Every, every month they were entering new markets, new markets, new markets. So you had to manage a brand for 70, 80 countries. And that's quite challenging because there are countries that are more advanced in the way that they use communications, countries where a brand is more, no, more known by the people, countries where you enter first, countries where you buy another brand and you have to manage the transition. So it's quite a daily job. The first that we had to do was to uh, redraw uh, their identity. Uh, I'm not a big fan of 3D logos. Uh, there was, uh, of course, tests and everything, and this was what consumers were uh, more uh, driven towards. So I don't mind it, but um, as working in branding, sometimes you have to, well, most of the time, you have to do what, what's good <laughs> for that brand and what's good for that consumer. Sometimes they call you because they just like your work, and that's even nicer because, okay, like on Alfa Romeo, most of the time it's like, okay, I enjoy doing those kind of things. I'm going to apply to a brand because I feel close to that kind of uh, story that the brand can tell. Other times I do what I think is right for the brand. So of course, making 
is such a complex logo, designing vector, work uh, around, um, with all touch points for a brand on 70, 80 countries is a job per se. Um, what we did, we designed a bespoke swatch book where we tested the logo on every single surface. And this was shipped to every country where uh, the brand is present. So if uh, an advertising agency or a marketing manager had to do an event, had to do a piece of merchandising, had to do it, um, anything, they knew how the logo was reproduced properly. And we designed this all from scratch. We designed this object from scratch. We designed a type, uh, a font from scratch with Dalton Mag, with Bruno, he's a good friend. Uh, it's got an amazing uh, type uh, design studio and foundry base in London. Um, with lots of Italians now, yes. And um, this was done really, really quickly. Uh, of course, taking into consideration legibility at every format, uh, the amount of condensation that we had to have, uh, new media, old media, uh, big posters, small print on uh, when, when you receive your bills. So great job with, uh, of course, the, the expertise of, um, of Bruno. And then in terms of our direction, uh, at a certain point there was a switch in between a, t a telecom company, there was more a service brand, until uh, that period and be the desire by the client to move the brand more into a lifestyle. So try to create a bit of emotional attachment in between the consumer and the brand because otherwise you give it for granted. Whatever career you've got is service. It's like electricity. You don't care. So we created a story and I don't have the book with me because I don't have the book in Milan. It's in my archi archive. And we did a proper book. I work with uh, Mark Reddy at BBH in London that I've learned so much from him. He's such an amazing uh, head of art. And uh, we just did a book uh, of like 40, 50 pages telling the story of the brand. How this, but not like a story in a uh, functional way or uh, but really trying to make people understand how they should communicate this brand, how this could be relevant. Something that 10 years ago, still do it on paper because I love it, I love paper. And now, for example, for another client, I'm just closing a video, a 60 second video with an Italian director and it's moving more and more into film and digital environment, but I still enjoy doing uh, print for that. So we designed this with, uh, we briefed illustrators, we worked with photographers, and we tried for each page to tell a story so that when you get to the last page and you were briefing an ad agency in India, in Milan, uh, wherever Vodafone was present, those art directors, those creative directors should have got the feeling of how the brand should speak to people, okay? And then, of course, the guideline instead play the role of being consistent. So with the guidelines, you tell a story about what's your logo, what's your color, how you use typography, what's your graphic grid, uh, what's your image style. But a brand has to communicate as well to the heart of who creates uh, communication later on. And these are some spreads from, uh, from the magazine. Um, and starting from the magazine, I s um, because telecoms were always working with photographers and because in the UK there is a great tradition and an eye for illustration, I started working with illustrators every time I had an opportunity to bring alive this new positioning of the Vodafone brand. And these are some of the examples of some of the illustration that uh, we commissioned when I, when I was there. And they were applied everywhere where possible. Well, less in Italy because Italy sometimes uh, maybe less now, but it's a bit reluctant on using illustration because they want to see photographs of people. But uh, northern countries or um, n new countries where there is more hunger for new, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and I, I really enjoy working with illustrators and I read it all their packaging line. Every pack, every line had a different illustration in it. So until that moment, a packaging of a phone was just a picture of the front, picture of the side, and that's it. 
and after the relaunch, each pack had a beautiful illustration done by a proper illustrator. Okay. Ah, sorry, the last thing about Vodafone, because this is more... Um, when I was working for Vodafone, at the beginning I was working with Ferrari on their uh, sponsorship, and then um, started working with Vodafone. And the challenge, uh, sorry, with McLaren, um, the challenge here was that um, Ron Dennis, that is the head of, uh, uh, of McLaren, has a very engineered perspective to uh, anything, from a car to branding. His headquarters are incredible. It's like going into a James Bond movie, incredible, where they dismantle the Formula One car is as clean as this floor. Everything is, I think it's a Rogers building, everything is detail, 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 and engineering perfection. So I was taken into meetings where, of course, the new uh, big sponsor was Vodafone. They wanted to be like fun, lively, uh, warm, consumer friendly. And on the other side, there was like a proper, proper cold brand sci-fi, proper sci-fi, typography, everything, color. And it was very challenging to find, um, no, and the second problem was, the first time I sat down with Ron Dennis, um, he looked at me in the eyes and he said, I hate the color red. Red for me is Ferrari. And I said, perfect. <laughs> it's gonna be very easy, this job. This is gonna be very, very easy. Okay. So, uh, actually, we got on very well at the end because we were so different in some ways, but we both wanted to do something interesting. So the first challenge was how can we bring these two brands together? And um, the idea was let's try to find a red that is not the Ferrari red, first thing. But will work fine on television because then Formula One, especially at the time, had, I don't remember, but 60, 70 million viewers every time there was now is, I think, is boring and is gone and I hope you guys don't uh, follow other things on television. But at the time was big investment, okay? So in order to find a, a creative bridge in between these two brands, the concept was, let's go back to the Silver Arrows. This was a, a Mercedes engine, of course. So we keep the silver. We, find, we do this car in beautifully silver. We find a red that is much more uh, um, flow. And in all the materials that you create, because as an art director, as a branding person, you create the DNA of a brand. Then goes to everybody. It goes to people who do sponsorship, who does apparel, who do product, um, web, everything. So you have to get an idea right at the beginning. I don't always do it, I always try. And here, we said, let's have, use a concept of red inside. So we keep the silver outside, we keep the silver arrow, we keep the engineering technology, but we find a red that is very strong, that is flow, and we use it inside. What does it mean? Of course, on the car, you have to use it where space is available. It's amazing how you apply branding on a Formula One car, because it's the, you have to work on the curves. So at the time, I haven't done it now in 10 years, but you go there with a the projector and you see how much your, the logos are distorted on the side of the car and you rework the graphics in order to make it as the logo look in real life. It's very time consuming. Red inside meant that when we, we work with Hugo Boss, with all the merchandising, everything was super silver, but you always had an opening, you always had something inside that was displaying the red that we chosen, okay? So from uh, uniforms, from the caps of the drivers, uh, merchandising, of course, mobile phone special edition done by Vodafone itself, and that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a divider sometimes, my person. <laughs> bear with me. The last project I'm going to show you very quickly about my previous life is a very small project, but um, I was very grateful because we were um, in the book of DNAD, that is one of the um, awards that I respect the most. When you work with big corporations, it's difficult to uh, do something different. You really have to push, 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 because of course they've got 
big, uh, heavy weights on their shoulders. So Vodafone entered into the music area and they started doing um, um, a music festival and uh, working with MTV and things like that. So it's a, they said, do an identity for our music um, offer. And I work with two fantastic guys uh, on this, with uh, actually three fantastic guys, and uh, they are still friends in the UK. And the idea was, let's do something very, very simple. Let's start from the uh, grammar of music. Let's create an alphabet out of it and use it for writing, for graphic shapes, for everything. So this was the identity that we created. This was the, um, uh, the starting point and that uh, the alphabet and the result I'm gonna show you in, um, these were the MTV ident, some of the MTV idents, of course, sorry. Very simple. You know what an ident is, when it's used in between programs or uh, when you've got those three seconds in television to advertise something. I did enjoy the simplicity. These were then all the campaign on how everything worked. This is still the old Vodafone format. Now there is the new one out. I quite like it actually. And from the same basic shape, we, desi we designed everything, posters and uh, all the applications around it. And sketches for the um, uh, events. Okay, let's move to Milan. Um, I'm gonna show you a few projects of the past two or three years, still all regarding branding, retail, and some packaging at the end. Well, the I think I'm gonna put the movie, but um, I start with something in fashion and luxury. Uh, Canali is a brand, a menswear brand, it was created in the 30s, but um, never had a, proper identity. Sometimes Italian brands are really good at doing stuff, but don't have a, they didn't have in the past a great way of communicating. And um, they called us to say, okay, we want to rebrand, we want to uh, tell a new story. So I went to visit how they make their product and we found out that there isn't one piece of glue in one of their jackets, everything is hand sewn. And in order to train a person to make a ja jacket, it takes two years of training. For two years, they just train to do uh, a kind of an operation on a jacket. Nothing of what they do is used. This is proper tailoring, proper beautiful handmade tailoring. This is a video that we did to uh, start showing what is the le level of detail that uh, they go through in order to create products that of course are very expensive and of course are very alluring for uh, international markets for, for the United States, for, for, for all the uh, new and rich countries uh, that, that want to buy the real made in Italy like uh, the Canal. So the creative idea behind this was gesture. Everything is done by hand. We already had the logotype given by the, the owners of Canali. They said, don't change the logotype, don't change the lettering, because it's uh, for the practical reason as well. But give us a symbol that has got a story behind it. And uh, we created this um, needle with this calligraphic C. And the sketch was done uh, by one of our design directors, Stefano. And then we worked with uh, a calligrapher artist uh, that I was using when I was based in London that uh, uh, is called Peter Horridge, uh, based in the UK, and is an amazing hand calligrapher. And I really wanted to have something handcrafted and not just done in Illustrator by, by us, but something really, really, really precious. And he sent us tons of hand sketches. We decided together which one was the best one. And we created the logo. Um, 
and this is th the base of the identity, so we chose um, some special gray color. We created a yellow uh, paper, and we work with uh, Favini as well in creating a paper, bespoke, where uh, we uh, impressed a pattern that we created for the brand. So as many bespoke elements, very few elements, that's how you work, work in luxury, so you don't go mad like when you work on uh, more mass market or fan brands. Very few things, but extreme bespoke and extreme attention to detail. So uh, if you have to choose a yellow, it can, yes, it can be a yellow, but you have to make your own yellow. If you have a paper that you like, but it's not in the right color, you have to push in order to have something just for you. And this is, this is the pleasure of, of working with uh, luxury and premium brands. And this identity then was applied everything, everywhere. The yellow comes from Milan, of course. If you uh, look around, there's some traditional Milan facades, especially from the 30s. This okra yellow was really used in architecture. It's a color very close to, to Milan. And uh, the gray, is, of course, as you can see today as well, is a color that we associate to Milan itself. We used to uh, type in contrast, uh, Dido and Gil. And this is the identity, how it's applied to uh, material. I don't know if I'm going slow or fast, because my phone is gone. I know. Am I going too slow? I'm going to speed up. And in order to make them uh, fresh as well, again, to bring them into this 21st century, Yes, we kept working in graphic grids and they keep doing shooting with, with the photographers and display the product, they work with amazing stylists. But we introduce uh, some bespoke illustration as well. We work with an illustrator called Keith Roy, based in England as well. Now I'm growing my contacts in Italy, but when I arrived, I only knew people in England, so I gave lots of jobs to England. Now, thanks to the magazine that I show you at the end, I'm trying to get to know Italy a bit better because there is talent everywhere. And this is the look and feel. I'm going to show you now, quickly, three projects for Nike um, that are all in the retail design space. So this is not just identity, this is retail design. In Future Brand, we have um, architect and we have a team that looks after retail. And some of these projects have been done in collaboration with a great friend that has got a studio in Milan, in Turin called Martina Tabo with a studio called Matt. I'm going to show you quickly the first one that we were asked to do were, uh, inside the new Juventus Stadium. We were asked to do two shops, but the two shops were displaying more or less the same merchandising. So the challenge was we have to do a shop outside, 120 square meters, open only two hours before the match and two hours after the match, and people go in masses. They go, they want to buy the t-shirt for the kids, they want to buy the present for, for themselves or for others. So this had to be a machine. So we brought all the experience outside, so mega screen outside, this was our learning. So let's make outside the square, the point where you don't stop. We use the auto grill experience, I've worked in retail for auto grill as well. So you enter from one door and you exit from the other door. And we had an array of 11 cash points, okay, and in 120 square meters. This is like beyond belief, but that's the only way to manage that. But then we had a 40 or 50 square meters small shop in the skybox area. So premium, only for the Agnellis and the Sky Friends and all that kind of clientele. So I said, what are we gonna do? Because it's gonna be the same T-shirt that is both outside for the kid is going to be upstairs. And the concept, I still remember, we were brainstorming with Martina, and Martina said, let's take away the product. Let's not have product. We just put images of the product, and people enter and do everything with the phone. I said, that's interesting. So we make it more precious by deleting it. You can't see it. We didn't go that far, but we created a different way of shopping. So you shop with a card. 
The product is on a beautiful display, but it's not touchable, and there is only one product. So outside, you have an array when you are in the other shop, T-shirt, 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 T-shirt. I take one, you take one. We all go to the cash point, we pay, we leave. Upstairs, I enter the space. I get given this um, beautiful hot, hot foiled logo um, paper folder. Inside the paper folder, I've got my personal card. I navigate the space. Each product is illuminated in its beautiful um, display. And when I want to buy a product, I take a token. I take a token of that product, okay? So if I like this product, I take a card from there. If I like this product, I take a card from there. And then I go to the cash point that is in the middle. The space is tiny. It's really small space. Cash point here in the middle. I give my little folder to an assistant. The assistant scans everything very quickly. And I pay. I get given a ticket and I leave, and I go and watch my match without any bag. So super premium. I don't have to go in my skybox with a uh, bag for t-shirts, etc. And at the end of the, um, of the match, the shop is closed. There is a little desk outside. There are all the bags ready, like when you are in duty free in uh, cool airports. You go back there with your little folder. There is a hostess. You, uh, you give the folder, and you get given your, uh, your bag, or if you want, you, they can send it home. It's exactly the same product as outside. It's just a different concept, a different way of... Uh, of um. And another thing that we, we did, we brought at the end a changeable experience, because people who go there, uh, they go every week, every two weeks, sorry. So why should they go back if the merchandising doesn't change? The t-shirt is often quite, this, quite the same. So at the end of the shop, so we, we force the flow of people to always rotate and uh, vis uh, visit the entire shop. We had a little interactive desk, and every two weeks, um, an object, a memorabilia from the Juventus Museum is put there in display. So I can have a cap, and I've got a video, and I've got an image, probably signed, etc. So even if I've been in the shop two weeks before, I don't want to see the same T-shirt, we force people to go back and back for experience. The other project uh, we did for Nike was on Nike running. Nike's got a bit of an issue when it communicates um, women sportswear in uh, uh, Southern Europe because North American approach to uh, sport is very, I wouldn't say masculine, but it's more uh, sweat and tears, okay? While Southern Europe is a bit of a beauty sport. So uh, girls go to the gym and they still use the makeup, okay? So their communication is very muscular and it wasn't really, at some point, of course, Nike is a fantastic, uh, I've learned so much from Nike. But in Italy, they were struggling a bit to communicate to uh, this target. So we said, okay, they had a space, they still have it, it's called um, Nike Lab, at the time it was called Nike Stadium, it's in front of Teatro Piccolo, it was a gallery in the past. I said, let's have a, a space that becomes uh, a pop-up shop for six months and generates content that will address in a much uh, more one-to-one -one communication way our target. So we don't go with like big advertising and saying, sweat and tears, muscular, muscular, etc. But we let um, f girlfriends speak with girlfriends about new products. So we took over the space. Um, we invited, again, my friend Martina, that is a um, female architect, and we work with her on creating a massive installation. We use 500 meters of uh, technical fiber to uh, invade the space and bring the people on the women's floor, because the women's floor was the most, um, um, the, le the less interesting. You had to walk up, etc. So we started this uh, net of super installations to bring people up, up here. Then we uh, made all the product available in boxes, like it just arrived, and the merchandising was done with um, uh, 
tra personal trainer from Virgin Active. There was a photographer, very good photographer from New York, Sky Parrot, doing photo shooting with the Canottieri, that is a famous uh, rowing and uh, um, water polo, I think, um, school here in Navigli. And all the communication, these were the cards that were given to people, were about uh, the Virgin Acting tri Trainers, the Canottieri, uh, the illustrators that we invited to do live illustrator in, in, in the walls. So using the shop as a media, not as a selling point. So every two weeks, I remember uh, Sting's daughter came to do a concert. More and more, shop uh, uh, branding in retail design is about experience, because now I can buy everything with this. Okay? If I want something tonight, I go home, I go on Amazon and I buy it. Don't need to go to a shop. No need. So more and more we are designing spaces that are very experiential. The product is nearly a given. Okay, I go to a shop, I have to find a product there. And this was one of the examples of our personal examples. Um, yeah, and this is sweet. This, these are the last minute things that you have to do. The night of the opening, we didn't know what to do with the shoe. So there was still a worker in the, we were finishing a wall in carton gesso. And we said, oh, what, should, what should we do, should we do? And he, uh, he got a knife and he said, let's, let's break the wall and put the shoe inside because it's very flexible. The old idea was in the shoe. Because they, they, we had ready a press pack, that is the one on the right, where we did a small uh, token, a small jewel in stereolithography with these amazing guys based in Turin, I don't remember the name. And this was our press pack for uh, the journalists, the PR, and all the ambassadors of the brand. I'm going to show you, I don't know what's this, uh, the last Nike project we've done. I'll show you probably here. So this is quite complicated. This is a multi-brand store, but uh, done in uh, Milan last year on football. Uh, and now we are trying to understand, still working on how to bring it in, uh, in other regions. And here the challenge was from the client, don't do something to didascale. Don't use uh, the football pitch lines. Don't use a gold net. Do something, they address the young, young, young. So the 15 years old, the 16 years old, that they live online all the time. So the concept here was to make the space as if it was an explosion of, uh, uh, of a football. So like shards of this dynamic shape, I'll show you later. And again, bringing experience, so personalization a small uh, football pitch outside where people can, uh, um, you can see it here, where people can try the shoes. And I work with a, a calligrapher uh, in Milan, that you might know, I don't know if he teaches here sometimes, Luca Barcellona, to do all the writings uh, for the walls, because I love his work. Um, and this was the result. So these this are uh, Lucas' um, writings, and this is the shop with this uh, techno feel uh, instead of... Um, ah, and another thing that I really enjoyed is um, on, <laughs> on a small lab upstairs, you can scan your, uh, you can scan your feet to see wh which shoes fit better. So we did a massive um, skeleton of a foot in multicolor, in, in this um, glass display, and that was real fun um, because we just sent out a 3D, a 3D drawing and uh, we just scaled it up and they made this fantastic uh, sculpture out of it. Uh, I really enjoy watching and more and much other stuff. I don't know how much time I've got. I'm going to show you something about Expo because this is quite, quite live. Um, I'm going to show you first Expo. How much time ago? Another 20 minutes, or is it too long? Are you bored? 20 minutes, too long? Less, 15. 20. Okay. <coughs> Expo, um, I have to be careful what I say about it. <laughs> because they've got lots of lawyers. 
a sensitive subject. Um, Expo wanted an identity, but they weren't, ver they weren't sure of briefing a, a, a studio or an agency or a famous designer, okay? So I said, okay, let's, let's try to involve people. I, I, it was a clever thing because, of course, it's Italy and people at the time were hearing the name Expo, everybody was thinking about corruption or something like that. So let's try to make it bottom up. Let's try to share it from the beginning. The timing was terrible. The logo was this one. There's, I'm not gonna say anything because I'm on video. Uh, when, when we close the video, I'm gonna probably say something about that. So first of all, uh, we said, okay, we have to, if, if it's gonna be designed by pre-professionals, so yeah, well, for me, everybody's a professional, but everybody that loves doing it, what you do has got a bit of experience. So there was a competition for uh, last day, last year, uh, grad or new graduated from design schools. How do you address that? Not easy. We uh, sent out posters and we made these posters with programmers that work on um, generative graphics because I was really into that at the time. And uh, I'll show you how generative graphics work on when we did the event. Practically, these guys from Turin um, designed uh, a software uh, generative, so it's always creating new shapes, new shapes, and because we said we want to do something where the subject is, we want to go into schools and say, your imagination is endless, you, you, you can do it, you can do something because um, uh, you are the designers of the future, you, you are fresh, let's do something that is not static, and what we did, the guys, amazing guys, did this programming where we uh, we could use it as projections and at the same time when we wanted randomly we could stop it and it was sending out a postscript file and we every poster was different and every poster was high res so that that for me was quite magic because when I see things on screen then they go out pixelated but they had a way of doing it that uh, was very new for for us I've never done anything in generative uh, graphics now uh, it's more and more used I've seen Segmeister now has done an identity all in generative graphics. It's, it's, it's a great thing to, but you have to work with great programmers. The logo itself, we, uh, we helped to, um, there was a committee of very famous people deciding which one were the two logos more uh, appropriate. And then uh, these two guys were sent in our studios and we helped them to craft the logo a bit better because they didn't have, of course, all the experience in order to make the logo work uh, on every platform. And that's how what is out there. This was my favorite version of the logo, and I have to say the favorite version of Mr. Armani as well, but I didn't pass much of the rest of the committee. And uh, it was the proper black and white, uh, more uh, extreme graphic shape. Uh, done with um, uh, patterns instead of gra uh, graduation and tints of, of, of the colors. It's still in the guideline, but I don't think anybody's using it, but it was my favorite. These are the guidelines. I've seen the cards yesterday, they don't look like this. I prefer it like this. I enjoy, I enjoy the fact that this logo had life, so you could actually open it up and uh, make it a bit contemporary in the way that you apply it because it's recognizable for shape. Some logos are recognizable for iconography. So you've got an icon that is so strong that one of my former uh, uh, bosses, one of the creative directors I've worked for, was saying when you draw a logo, it has to be redrawable. People, even if they don't know how to draw it, they have to think in their mind that they know how to draw it. Okay, that's memorable. This logo doesn't play on memorability. It's not like uh, an icon, it's shapes. So our recommendation was like, make the most of the shapes. And uh, this, for example, was the, uh, 
they are called mnemonic or end frame TV. When you have the, in branding now you design uh, how a logo closes a, a film, a communication, what kind of animation, what kind of sound. It's very interesting designing sound for logos because uh, it's quite subjective territory as well. It's not easy for a client. To, it can be, I like it, I don't like it. No, it's, it's complicated. Okay, the last three projects, I'm gonna show something regarding packaging because in future then we have amazing experience in packaging. It was created by a guy called uh, Joe Rossi that has designed lots of packaging. I'm not gonna show anything mass market. I'm gonna show a wine and um, I don't remember. I'll put later. I'll show this one because uh, to, to show you an idea again on how at the end of the day, as a designer, as an art director, you apply the methodology to every field that you work on. You always have to try and find the concept, work with the concept, and then if you are capable to design it yourself, and if you like it doing, you do it yourself. Otherwise, you have to find the best people for the job. Uh, this winery came to us uh, two years ago, and this was the label. Okay, this is based in uh, uh, Piemonte. It's a, it's, a, it's a white wine. It's a good wine. But when we saw it, we said, mm, okay, it's got more Chinese references than Italian references. But the former owner really liked this, uh, it's called a pistriche, this kind of dragon, because he had a personal relationship with this uh, dragon. So he said, you have to keep it. And I said, okay, how are we going to keep a dragon on an Italian wine? I said, let's do it with, a, with an idea and not with a drawing. So we reduced the dragon to a logo and we created the story of the three territories that this dragon manages to live and in the, myth, myth, uh, in the myth of this dragon, he can swim, he can fly, and he can run on, uh, on Earth. So this was the logo that we created. The dra dragon became just a point of yellow and the typography is done with uh, Francesco, a great uh, friend and designer. In, in, in our design studio. And the idea was to uh, illustrate in a very simple way these three, uh, the land, the water, and the air. And we gave the names according to it. So one, uh, one of the wines is called Passo, so it's the step, is when the dragon is running. One is the Tuffo, and the dragon is jumping into the water, and one is the volo, and the dragon is flying. And the reference for, for those who like, for example, uh, I was in love with one of the illustrators who's done lots of Radiohead uh, posters and Killians, just drawing with a thick pencil these uh, black lines on, uh, on paper, and then creating an identity of this the dragon is still there, but he's there as a story. We don't need to put a big dragon. We just put the, way, the, the, the land, the, the, the sea, and, the, and, um, and then you have the spot on top. Doesn't happen every day, unfortunately, not in my life. So here, from this photograph, you can see a bit better the quality. And I go back to the Canali example. On some project, it's not much about big visuals, but it's about the experience and choosing the right technique in order to uh, make it work. Okay, I'm nearly finished, the last five minutes. Um, I'm quite passionate about what I do. I love working for clients, but uh, I do random projects sometimes, and this is one of my random projects. They started um, with my uh, partner and wife uh, on a Sunday morning where we said, we've met so many talented artists in life and photographers and writers and uh, we said, why don't we, wouldn't it be amazing to have a dinner party where we invite all these uh, amazing people around the table because we were living in Milan, we found it difficult to stay in contact with all the people. I've, been, I've done shooting in Australia, I've done shooting in New Zealand, I've, we both have worked on uh, far away with great people. 
So he said, let's, let's, let's do it as a magazine. Let's call it Parterre de Roi, that means the court of the king. Like if it was our selected invitation for these friends to sit around the table. And it's like having a, one word on the menu, that is the theme of each magazine. And we sent out this invitation to three kind of important people that we met in the past. And they replied straight away. So we said, oh, fuck, now we have to do it. <laughs> because they said, yes, we need to do it. And now we are at the third issue. We launched the third issue last week. It's going to be uh, in store um, from uh, when we've got time to deliver it. We only print 500 copies. They are all numbered. Um, they are proper printed, offset, not digital. And uh, it's distributed uh, in Milan, in London, in Berlin, uh, in New York, uh, in Vienna, and in Tokyo. And it's a great pleasure to, we, s we wrote to 10 bookstores that we really respect because they have great stuff. And when they said yes, some they said no, like uh, Printed Matter said no, that's got amazing stuff. But Do You Read Me says yes straight away. T. Dakayama in Tokyo, they wrote to us. Uh, Artworks, we are in Artworks. We are in McNally Jackson in so in New York. We are in Corso Como. So it's been a pleasure seeing some of our work out there done with friends. This has got like zero budget. We don't even know how to do advertising. We just work overnight, work weekends. When we are ready, we print it. We usually do a party, and that's the way we do it. So I'm going to show you some uh, screenshots. There is no um, editorial graphic grid. I, we used to turn Futura across, but we don't. We want to look different from other magazine. We don't want to have, we want every issue to be a bit of a surprise because we only do 500 copies. We want people to try and collect it. It has to be a bit precious. So if I use, I mean, for clients, when I do editorial for clients, of course I use a graphic grid. I use my two fonts, three fonts, etc. But this has to be different. It's, it has to be a bit mad as well. So the first one was Cork. These are the three covers. They are here. I'm going to leave some copies for you for the school. I don't know. And then you, you guys, these are not the, the numbered one. But we try to have a front cover that is always recognizable. And from the next one, I'm going to try to go without a masthead. We don't want the logo to be too visible. But we want people to recognize uh, the style of the cover. And it's always a uh, collage at this, at this time. The first one was called Carnal, and uh, we always have a, a writer um, that introduces the, the issue with uh, uh, illustrating uh, the word. And then we have photographers that uh, work with us, or writers. This is an amazing New York photographer called uh, Ben Pierre. This is Alessandro Fracavento, one of the best fashion writers in Italy that enjoys doing poetry and other stuff. Sophie, an um, um, English um, artist. This is a picture of her studio. Uh, Nicholas Howalt that shot uh, amateur boxers for the first match, okay, the first time they go and fight. He took exactly the same shoot before the, the, the match and after. Okay, so it's that moment where you never have the fight in your life, only training, and you are there, you are 16, you are 14, before going and fighting, and just, and as you, you can see which one is the after, of course. Um, Pietro Samori, fantastic Italian um, artist, Bottom right, Pietro said, the great tattoo artist based here in Milan. The second issue was called Absent. And uh, we had Candida Offer. Um, for those who don't know it, one of the most amazing uh, photographers, um, especially of uh, spaces. And it was very rewarding. We wrote to her. And she said, okay, send me a magazine. I have a look. If I like it, uh, I'll do it. And uh, after two weeks, we had in our letterbox her book with a little note handwritten by her saying, I'm going to do it. And that was a uh, great pleasure. Um, this is a rapper that now is a poet that did some poetry for us. 
and a very good friend photographer from London I work in the past called David Ellis did a shooting portrait of him using gel lighting. Thomas Dozol, top right. Patti Solo sent us her staff as a photographer. And other bespoke shooting, this is um, a photographer that um, I really like. I'm gonna, sh and um, Andrew Minsky's. And this is the last issue that is here now. It's called Rebellion. Uh, the lettering artist is a Greek guy, uh, part of a duo called Black Black, and uh, he mainly does big scale uh, black and white graffitis, but he does lettering as well. And uh, we had a small interview with uh, John Waters. Um, this one, this is a very interesting uh, photographer from the UK who's about to publish a documentary called Dog in Tales, where he got made a bespoke infrared camera and uh, went in the woods uh, taking pictures of um, uh, sex exchangers before we go there and <laughs> exchange partners. And uh, the shooting is really beautiful, I think, especially for this technique. And the documentary will be out this year. I've seen a preview uh, and it's very strong. We went back, uh, Gavin walks on top left, looking at his archive of raving in the 80s. Iranian artist uh, Shadi Gadrin. This is a up and coming Chinese photographer, Ren Hang. A shooting of Marina Abramovic. Um, Jeff Stauffacher, I don't know, is somebody, he's 91 years old now, and he's one of the first great American letterpress uh, uh, artists. And uh, we managed to get the San Francisco, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art to uh, go and scan some of the pieces that they've got in their archive. Uh, this is where he illustrated uh, a book by Albert, uh, Albert Camus, The Rebel. And other artists that you, you can have a look later here. Jacopo Benassi, one of my favorite Italian photographers, only shoots in black and white and uh, Great photographer, you should check out his work. Very hardcore. And he did a shooting in Genoa of this uh, uh, Marie Lou, that is a prostitute that came after the war to work as a prostitute in Genoa in an interview. And the shooting is so raw, so beautiful. Really beautiful imagery. Uh, Nicolas Jar, the uh, electronic musician, I don't know if you know him, based in New York. And that's it. So, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit long. Because I might, if you've got questions, I'm sure you might be bored by now and hungry. Uh, can you? No, I, I think oh, so these other. Hello. Um, it's great work again. Um, I just wanted to ask what happens when you get a brief from a client or if you're trying to make a, a design pitch? Yeah. You have how, how many ideas do you present in front of the client? Okay. I've asked this question to various designers and many of them have a variety amount of answers. Some say you only present two that you're really sure of. Some say you present four to five. Yeah. But then what happens here is the client might, if you present two, the client will like, okay, he didn't, yeah. that's it, it's only two. And my second, second question is, what happens when the idea flops? Um, I cry. <laughs> you cry. <laughs> <laughs> and shout. <laughs> so what, what happens when, the, when there is no room for comfort? Like the client, okay, I don't like this at all. So you, do you still insist on your idea? Or do you compromise with the client and make something mediocre? Okay. Now, um, the, my job is changing, okay? The, the, the way that 
for example, when I was working with, in London with a, one of my, I wouldn't say old school, I like the word old school anyway, but one of my senior creative directors was already in his sick, late 50s, early 60s. He always said, there is only one idea. You go with one idea. And I've seen, I went for a pitch on Nastro Azzurro rebranding. Do you know Peroni Nastro Azzurro? Yeah. And there was like a French agency, there were everybody having hundreds of ideas. And my former creative director in the, in the field, he's an amazing beer designer, went with one idea and he said, put this in research. If it fails, my job is on the line. I don't have the courage yet, <laughs> okay? Uh, I still think that should be the approach, especially if you are a creative director, you should know what's right for a client. Uh, but the, unfortunately, the market is changing. So clients are cherry picking. They want to have more ideas. They want to choose a bit themselves. So you have to present more than one idea. We usually only present what we believe in. So what you do, you polarize the brief a bit. Okay, I did a pitch two days ago for a packaging job where a relaunch of a brand in Italy could have gone like very indulgent, so mm, yummy, yummy, or could have gone um, party, celebration, okay? Now, when, when you have this opportunity to polarize the brief, what you do, you, you present the spectrum, but you have to make the client and yourself aware of the fact that your design can't fulfill everything, okay? You have to be long-lasting as well, because the difference in between design and advertising and branding is advertising is timing. Timing, timing. What we do in branding sometimes lasts even 50 years, 60 years. Look at the amazing examples of you know, the Campari bottle. That's examples of timeless design. And it's more and more difficult. So unfortunately, to answer your question, we don't present one idea. We might even present three or five. We always have a reason why pre we present those ideas, and we have implications and plus and minuses, and we always have a recommendation. If the recommendation, to answer your second, second question, so we always bring what we like. So that helps the fact that the client won't choose something that you don't like. But I had an issue two years ago with a client uh, in the bathroom sector that at the end of the day they took me off the client, okay? The client moved to Future Brand London because I wasn't compromising. But you pay for that. It's, ne it's never easy. It's never easy. But you go to bed and you feel good. But I can't do it. I cannot do it all the time. I cannot do it all the time. Sometimes I do it. Sometimes you try to find a compromise you win and lose battles, okay? So you have to find a good balance. And when consumer research is involved, you have less and less ammunition. Because if they test something, consumers are stronger than what you say. So first of all, you have to tr try to avoid going into testing, okay? <laughs> but most of the time, yeah, I hate testing. It's rubbish. Um, I work with clients that they use neuro, neuroscience testing, okay? They, they, are we still filming? No. I can go straight. <laughs> so, okay, I work with clients that you do a design, and it's okay if, you, if somebody does a design, I don't know, of um, I don't know, a toothbrush, okay? So you've got three centimeters by 12 centimeters. I'm not good at that. I've got guys in my studio fantastic at doing that kind of work. I'm rubbish at that. I understand why you want to do neuro scanning because you want to see your eyes. Have you ever seen the results of a neuroscience? You have patches of colors, okay? And depending, you, you've, you read it depending. One color means long attention on the point, one color, your eyes stay less, and then you've got a track of where your eyes goes first and where it ends, okay? So I understand on some items, but research has to be used rightly, okay? I've, 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 I've 
you know, filming. I had a client that neuroscanned a poster, okay, a beautiful poster, to tell me, oh, the type has to be increased like 20%. I'm not gonna do it, I can read it. I don't need neuroscanning to do it. If I increase the type, it's gonna be ugly. And that's, that's the challenge nowadays. You have to find, and there are out there, there are fantastic clients, because they are much more savvy. Most clients, they already have like a great uh, sensibility, great aesthetic. Uh, so 20 years ago, a client was sitting next to an art director, to a designer, and you say, okay, this is your job, this is my job. I tell you if I don't like it, but I trust you, okay? And we had some amazing work done in those years. Now the client and the consumers are part of the conversation. So you have to work with it. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's very difficult. If a client is uninspiring and they test everything and they trust and test consumer research more than you, you're fucked. Like, if you're lucky, you get an average job out there, if you're lucky. If a client starts trusting you and you start working on a relationship and uh, you can do some great work, even with clients that are massive corporations or they've got like commercial demands on how they have to succeed. And this, this is heavy, no? Because if you do a magazine or if you do a, the, uh, the art direction for a, I don't know, for an art gallery, it's much easier. But when you've got clients that they buy millions in advertising, they print packaging and it costs millions, something has to last five years, etc. That's heavy, heavy. Decisions are heavier and heavier. And you feel that it's not an easy job. It's not the best part of the job, I have to say. The reason why I asked you that question was um, you had had this example of Vodafone. Yes. Where you had gone to McLaren and he said, I hate red. Yeah. I don't like red because it reminds me of Ferrari. Yeah. But at the end, you somehow still came up with uh, so how do you turn that absolute no into no, okay. uh, yes? One of the main difference in between a designer and an artist, I'm gonna be very simplistic here, so don't quote me on that, but as a designer, you have to be a bit of a problem solver as well. It's not just artistry, okay? Then there are amazing artist designers, there are people in between, but you are a bit of a problem solver. It's never, you know, do something beautiful on this wall that some designers can do because they've got the skills. So you have to work with it. And that's not the only problem you will encounter. You encounter problems on um, not having budget to reproduce something the way you want to do it. You encounter problems on how the brand was before you arrived to work with them. Some rebranding projects, they arrive to you and they look terrible, they look rubbish. And if you do it completely differently, people will recognize the brand. So you're stuck from the beginning, okay? But you have to work with it because you are a designer. So you have to work around it and find a way to try and find a solution. It's not easy, but it's fun yeah. sometimes. <laughs> Any other question? Thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry to stay Thank so you, Johnny. Thank you so much.